decided to go into medicine, you're gonna take lots of standardized exams and all of them are gonna help decide the direction of your career. First, as a pre-med, you take the MCAT. Then in med school, it's step one, step two, and in residency, you'll be required to pass step three in training exams or ITEs. And then when you finally graduate residency, rigorous board exam. So it's clear that standardized testing is a skill that you can develop and one that will serve you well on your way through your medical career. And in my experience, the strategies for success in standardized testing are universal. By learning how to study with the system I'm going to show you, I improved my score by 20 points from step one to a 264 in step two. Each of these exams tests different knowledge, but the principles for scoring highly on them are pretty much the same. If you develop a robust system to prepare for one standardized exam, you'll be prepared to crush any of them. Hi guys, my name's Tim and I'm a first year medical resident in Cincinnati. In this video, I put together a system for taking standardized exams that will set you up for success. As an added bonus, watch to the end of the video for four evidence-based biohacks to study more efficiently and learn faster. The first part of the system is learn the rules. When it really comes down to it, a standardized test is really just a game with a defined set of rules. You don't have to like it. You just have to learn to play the game in a way that gives you the highest score. Because let's face it, this is the only objective way to prove your fund of knowledge on your application. Ignoring any of the rules of engagement could put you in a position where you don't score as highly as you deserve. So the first of these is the weight of the subjects on the exam. This is probably the most important rule to get familiar with. You need to know exactly which subjects will be tested the most on the exam and you need to plan your studying accordingly. Know which disciplines are the most high yield. For example, on the MCAT, biology and biochemistry have the most questions. Pathology is the most heavily tested subject on step one, and internal medicine has the most questions on step two. Tailor your study plan to put more work into these subjects, as well as those that you need the most work on. You can actually calculate the relative importance of each subject or discipline based on your performance as you track your progress. And this is how I calculated mine for step two. I multiplied my percentile rank in each subject on UWorld by the weight of that discipline on the exam. For me, this was a neat and simple way to quantify which areas I stood to gain the most points. The next rule is the time per question. Standardized tests obviously have a time limit for each section. So you need to know exactly how many seconds you have on average per question in each block. But it's not enough to know it, you have to practice it. I can't stress this part enough. If you don't train to finish questions at the correct pace without taking breaks or pausing the exam, you will struggle during the test and your score will suffer. This is a major adjustment that I had to make after step one that helped me score 20 points higher on step two. When you train yourself to complete practice questions on pace, you'll develop an internal clock of how far behind or ahead you are during each block. The more you train this way, the faster you'll be at reading and answering each question in less than the allotted time per question. And by the way, this doesn't mean every single question has to be answered on time. There are always questions that are meant to be extremely difficult and time consuming. But within the same block, there are usually easier questions that you can answer early to give yourself extra time to answer those more difficult ones. And in case you don't know, you can figure out the time per question by dividing length of the block by the number of questions. For the USMLE step one and step two, it's 90 seconds per question. And for the MCAT, about 100 seconds per question, give or take a few seconds, depending on which section you're taking. Every time you do a practice block, keep one eye on the clock to know if you're on pace. For example, if you're on question 10 out of 40 on a step one block, you should automatically know that you should finish that question by the 15 minute mark. The next rule of the game is time the breaks. Every exam has a built-in break time that you can use to your advantage. It's always optional and nobody's gonna stop you from taking the entire exam in one sitting, but I would really, really recommend against that. If you don't take advantage of time to rest your brain between these strenuous blocks during a seven to nine hour exam period, you really won't perform at your best. And that's because there is evidence that breaks are important for learning and cognition. Our brain centers for learning and memory function much more efficiently when we rest during a long period of mental work. This is especially important to take advantage of during your practice blocks to maximize retention. Scientists at NIH used a highly sensitive brain scanner to show that your brain literally replays mental repetitions of the information and skills that you're training while you're taking a break. And it does this in the background while you get some much needed rest and relaxation. Every standardized test has a strong component of reading comprehension. I put in thousands of hours and tens of thousands of practice questions. I've lost count of how many questions I got wrong that I knew the answer to just because I didn't read the question carefully. One way you can avoid this mistake is reading the actual question on the bottom first to identify what they're asking you, then going back to the start of the paragraph to read the whole passage. The next part of the 
system is plan your timeline. Start planning ahead. You wanna schedule your test date on a day that comes after a long period of time off that allows you to put in the hours of studying that you need. For the MCAT, this is typically three to four months. And for step one, step two, six to eight weeks. Plan how much time each week you can devote to studying. Don't be overly ambitious or specific with your study schedule because that'll set you up for getting discouraged and derailed from your study plan. You want to be realistic here. Plan a number of total study hours or amount of material each day that you can hit routinely. Life is full of so many unplanned interruptions. So leave some flex time each day to compensate for those. And on the flip side, be ready to take advantage of any unexpected downtime that you get throughout the day. When you're in school, it's easy to block out protected study months, but once you're in residency, it's a different story. When you have to study for step three and the in-training exams, your study hours and free time will be a lot less predictable. And even when you finally have free time at home, you usually just wanna eat and go to sleep. So taking advantage of this downtime at the hospital when you have the energy is a really good habit. You don't wanna set daily goals, you wanna set weekly goals for your studying. That gives you more flexibility around the inevitable interruptions that will happen day to day. There are guaranteed to be several days where you fall behind in your planned study schedule. By setting weekly goals and leaving flex time every day, you're better able to make up for lost time, hit your weekly goals, and avoid becoming discouraged and falling off track. And then at the end of each week, I would highly recommend scheduling one personal day just to prevent yourself from burning out. And it's a nice reward for hitting your goal for the week. The next part of the system is choosing your study materials wisely. You need to choose your study resources and stick with them. The board prep market nowadays has been absolutely saturated with options for content review that you can just go crazy trying to figure out which one is gonna work best for you. The worst mistake I made when studying for step one was I got distracted by all the different shiny textbooks and question banks. Because of this, I cluttered my brain with superficial knowledge and different teaching styles from several different resources without really committing to one of them and learning in depth from that one resource. So the best way to content review is to pick your resources from the outset and building your study routine around them. When I took the MCAT, the three heavyweight study resources were Kaplan, Exam Crackers, and Princeton Review. And truthfully, none of these is really much better than the other for giving you a high score, as long as you pick one of them and commit to learning the material in depth with one of those programs, preferably with as many passes as you can. The other huge mistake that students make is not choosing the highest quality question bank for practice blocks. Don't spread yourself thin trying to complete three entire question blocks like I did. Choose the one question bank, preferably the one that's the gold standard, and do those questions as many times as you can, repeating the ones that you get incorrect so that the concepts are seared into your mind. And if you're watching this, getting ready to take the MCAT or the USMLEs, I'll save you the trouble. The gold standard is you world. Don't just do the questions. If you get a question wrong, take full advantage of the answer explanation. You need to diagnose the exact reason that you got that question wrong and write a sentence explaining the concept that you got wrong. When I studied for step two, I wrote down hundreds of these concepts after incorrect questions to save for reviewing later. I reviewed this list several times to the point where I had them branded in my memory. And thanks to this strategy, by the time I was a couple weeks out from the exam, I was scoring 95 to 100% on my UWorld blocks. The next part of the system is track your progress. To build confidence leading up to the exam and tracking your progress, there's just no substitute for a good old fashioned timed practice exam. I prefer taking at least one practice exam per week, each week leading to the exam. For steps one and two, I took 10 to 15 timed exams. By tracking your score improvement or lack thereof, you'll get a great idea of where you stand. But the other really important benefit of taking time practice exams is by simulating the test conditions as closely as possible. They're not gonna let you bring your phone, food, drink, or just about anything other than the clothes on your back in front of that computer when you take your test. So that's exactly how you should simulate your practice exams when you take them timed. Have a quiet environment, use earplugs if you have them, turn off or put away your phone, and stick to your timed breaks. Never take more break time than you will have on test day, because this is just only gonna hurt your mental stamina. And trust me, I learned this from experience. This is another mistake that I made for step one. Once I broke that bad habit, it made a huge difference for step two. And the final part of the system is trust the process. You're going to have moments along the way where you feel like you're not making progress. It's normal, trust me. Everybody experiences it. It's important to have patience and trust the system you built to perform well on this exam. Every hour of studying is progress and every wrong answer is another learning opportunity. You'll have days where you just don't feel like studying and other days where you just feel like you're not making headway and you're not getting the practice block scores that you think you deserve. I've been there. Just remember that your daily performance may go up or down day to day, but if you're truly putting in the reps, 
in the practice, the long-term trend can only go upward. And as a bonus for all of you that made it this far, here are four science-backed natural performance enhancers that will approve your study efficiency and performance for any exam. Sleep. Sleep is the most potent performance enhancing drug on the planet. It's absolutely crucial for retaining what you study and learning new concepts quickly. Get seven to eight hours of quality sleep every night. Use blackout curtains or a sleep mask to block out ambient light and use earplugs if you need to block out any noise. Exercise. Exercise of any form has been proven to enhance your brain's ability to learn. During exercise, your body releases proteins that enhance your brain's Ability to form new connections and learn faster. So on your study breaks, go to the gym. Hydration. Dehydration is proven to have negative effects on mood, concentration, short-term memory, and retention. And rehydration fixes that by improving short-term memory, improving focus, attention span, and energy levels. Stay hydrated when you're studying and bring a huge water bottle to the testing center. Workspace. A workspace with natural light is proven to stimulate the brain, making it ready to learn. It releases the same protein that exercise does, which makes your brain more ready to form new connections. Declutter your workspace to clear your visual field of distractions and enhance your focus. Put your phone away so you can reach deep focus and understanding of the content that you're studying. Well guys, I hope you got some value from this video. As always, leave any questions in the comments. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.